Okay, the next talk is Greg Valdez, Synaptic Biomarkers, Promise and Perils, Identifying and Using Them to Optimize Neuronal Health. Take it away, Greg. Sounds good. Huh. That is not my computer, so we need to change this. There you go. Uh, well, first of all, let me just give a, a couple of quick plugs here and, no, and acknowledgments. First to Mike and Tor and everyone who has worked so hard to put this great meeting together. Uh, the other plug, or the plug that I'd like to make is for the new center that uh, we formed here that is led by my colleague and dear friend Mike Fox, the Developmental Translational and Neurobiology Center. We love long, long titles for centers and graduate programs, as you can see, so a mouthful. The other one, uh, which is even more important, at least to me, is are the members of my lab. I am very fortunate to have uh, maybe not here, they some, somehow love to take pictures with a buzz when it was here, but not with me in it. Uh, nevertheless, these guys are incredibly committed to what they do. Um, they work very, very hard, and as all of you who are uh, he heads of lab know, we can't stand up here and do what we do and present our data if they don't do um, their, their work and, and commit themselves as much as they do. So thank you to all of them. Um, so what do we do in my lab? So I guess I have to stay here. Uh, so what we do in my lab is, uh, in general, is to look at um, age-related changes in the nervous system, but also uh, outside of the, nervous, of the central nervous system, in the peripheral nervous system. And when we're not looking at aging itself, we're looking at uh, the most uh, prominent age-related diseases, neurological diseases, ALS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's. Uh, we've dove a little bit into Alzheimer's, uh, not so much into Parkinson's and Huntington's. Um, we've targeted these diseases alongside the normal aging process because we simply don't understand enough about how, how and when these diseases begin. As you've heard from Brad, if I remember your name right, and uh, Mike Wood earlier, um, we're still looking at these diseases and trying to develop approaches, find therapeutics, uh, using animal models, but also looking at patients uh, that already have symptoms. They're symptomatic, they have the disease. So what does that mean? That means that there's an ongoing fire in the brain, spinal cord, skeletal muscles of those individuals, and that is a problem, right? That's a big problem because we're not really treating the disease itself, we're treating the symptoms. Um, when we look at biomarkers, we're not looking at biomarkers that tell us when the, the disease is about to happen and therefore whether we have a therapeutic an approach that can not just mitigate but stop the disease. We're looking at biomarkers as uh, shown here oftentimes that are associated with a lot of different uh, metabolic, uh, molecular, cellular changes in the brain and other regions of the body. And so they're not exactly very accurate um, indicators of whether someone is going to have the disease. They simply tell us that they do have the disease, and that's a problem for uh, finding therapeutics. And I think that Reed, in addition to molecular biomarkers, alluded to the other problem, that is we don't have the phenotypes. Uh, we need to continue to work on that, and Brad talked about that quite well, er, quite well, well earlier. Um, so what is it that we're trying to do in my lab, specifically? Obviously, we can't look at everything. We're looking at synapses. We're looking at what is it that happens to uh, synapses with aging, but some of these age-related diseases, and very specifically, at least 70% of the lab focuses on ALS in the realm of diseases. And we're interested in synapses, well, for the obvious, and that is that if you look at the literature, synaptic malfunction, synaptic dysregulation, is one of the first, if not the first, manifestation of any of these diseases, Alzheimer's, ALS, and the other two. Um, when you graph this, what you find is that synaptic malfunction, but also synaptic loss, happens before metabolic and other molecular dysregulation, and certainly both of those happen before neuronal uh, neurons are lost. Right? And in order to manifest the disease, especially in ALS, you need to lose at least 70% of your motor neurons. That's quite a bit. I mean, the fire is pretty, has pretty much consumed most of the house to keep running with that analogy. And so for ALS, we know, and this is work that we've done in my lab and that uh, other people have done, uh, we know that uh, synapses that uh, connect with motor neurons, the motor neurons in the spinal cord, 
uh, form with proprioceptive sensory neurons, but also descending primary, primary motor neurons, interneurons, that those synapses degenerate before the cell body, the motor neuron cell body soma, uh, dies. Right? We've published papers showing that this connection of motor neurons, the other end, the synapse that they form with skeletal muscles called the neuromuscular junction, that that synapse degenerates before synapses in the central nervous system, the ones, the inputs that come onto the sum of motor neuron um, degenerate. Right? So what this is telling us is that the neuromuscular junction may be the focus site of pathology. This is very important, right? So I'm making sort of a broad uh, statement here that synapses may be the focal site of pathology for some of these diseases, but synapses are not all created equal, right? And this is exemplified by the synapses that are in the central nervous system for the lower part of the motor system and those that are in the periphery, the neuromuscular junction. So this synapse outside of the central nervous system is uh, much more susceptible to the disease. And what happens is that very early before symptoms, the synapse degenerates. The motor axon retracts from the, its innervating muscle fiber and thus uh, degenerates and then eventually the motor neuron dies. And this is better exemplified here where after the synapse degenerates, this is a, a schematic from Don Cleveland, uh, after the uh, synapse, the neuromuscular junction degenerates, there's a slew of cellular molecular changes that happens throughout the axon, the soma, and also in the spinal cord uh, around motor neurons. Now, what we've known for quite a while is that this degeneration of the neuromuscular junction that happens quite early, before symptoms, that actually continues to occur before we see any signs uh, of uh, motor function, any degeneration of motor function. And what happens is that, oops, a little bit too far up. What happens is that the motor axon retracts, the motor axon regenerates and reinnervates its muscle, and this happens for quite a while, okay? It continues to happen and eventually this process here tilts, balance tilts to the other side where the axon completely degenerates and then it hits the soma and there goes the motor neuron. Right. So what this suggests is that there are molecules within muscles, skeletal muscles, that may be promoting this what we call compensatory reinnervation, right? Promoting the maintenance of the synapse but also the repair of the synapse. And this actually was somewhat proven, not using an ALS mouse model, but just a wild type um, um, animal, mouse, uh, by a colleague of mine when I was at Harvard, uh, Corey McCann. And what he did was, he asked a very simple question. If skeletal muscle fibers are, are really that important for maintaining the neuromuscular junction, for maintaining the motor axon, you will hypothesize then that if you shut off a muscle fiber that is innovated, that motor axon will degenerate. So he shut off, he stopped translation, right? so this muscle fiber now is incapable of secreting factors that presumably are required for maintaining its innovation, for maintaining the motor, motor axon. And when he shut off translation in this muscle fiber, in this magenta color, uh, that motor axon began to retract and degenerate. So apparently there are some secretive factors and they're very focal. They concentrate around the neuromuscular junction that are required for maintaining its proper structure. As you can see here, this neuromuscular junction, the muscle fibers that they are innovating, um, they are not affected at all. The muscle fibers are perfectly innovated. Now, we spent quite a bit of time in my lab trying to figure out what are those factors. And it's very difficult to do this using translational inhibitors, so we've developed an uh, injury method to do this. And what we've decided to do was, what if we can visualize and time the repair of the neuromuscular junction, every facet of it, every phase of regeneration of repair of the neuromuscular junction, can we then go back and look for molecules that are alter each one of those stages, at those steps. So we developed a injury method, an injury assay that allows us to do that. And I won't go into a whole lot of details about this. A medical student in my lab published this in Jove, and so there's a nice video that complements that. But basically what we can do is we can injure without completely severing uh, motor axons, 
We can injure the motor axons. It causes complete degeneration of its stump near the innervating muscles. And within seven days, the motor axons regrow to muscles that they innovate, in this case, the TVLS anterior, EDL muscles, those are extensors, extensor muscles, and they reform neuromuscular junction. And this is what that looks like in higher magnification. Early in the process, this is seven days, motor axons are beginning to find their previous targets. And then by nine days, you have motor axons that are now changing their growth cone from a navigating growth cone to a growth cone that has to form a presynaptic end, and then for faithful neurotransmission. And by 12 days, um, most of the motor axon has transformed itself into a presynaptic end. So those are the stages of repair, and this is quite um, reliable. When we do this across different animals, same sex, same age, we find that the same number, similar number of neuromuscular junctions show this type of features. So what we've done is we've taken advantage of this uh, improved assay for looking, assaying, looking for molecules involved in this process. It's telling an axon stop growing, transform from a growth cone to a presynaptic site, and reform uh, the, the synapse. We've taken advantage to ask what are the molecules that are altered in skeletal muscles. And as you can see here, this is a torturous heat map. I'm sure you've seen many of this. Control. Uh, one day, four days, seven days, nine days, 12 days. Here is where the neuromuscular junction, this synapse is beginning to reform. Okay? So what it means is that in green, molecules, the molecules in green here are upregulated, in red, they're downregulated, so there's a lot of them. Okay? We can't possibly look at all of them. It will take everyone in this room and many, many more. But what we can do is use a bit of our smarts and um, come up with a few different categories um, strategies to categorize some of this molecule. One of it is, well, are they altered? Well, yeah, of course, this is where they come from. They are altered. Are they altered at specific st stages when the neuromuscular junction is reforming, which will be a seven, nine, 12 days? Um, are they expressed by muscle fibers and parasynaptic Schwann cells? Why is that important? Well, because muscle fibers are the one that form the postsynaptic end of the synapse, and parasynaptic Schwann cells are the astrocytes of the peripheral nervous system, so very important for the stability of that synapse. And then one can ask a slew of other questions, including what about uh, the function, potential function of these molecules if they are in fact altered and have these different features, do they maintain those features in a mouse model for ALS, which is categorized by denervation and re just as this injury method here. And so let me t take you to the data that we have, that we've been able to gather. And this is all published data, um, but I think we're on the right track here for at least making some progress uh, for identifying molecules that function to repair synapses and also potentially as biomarkers. So here's one molecule that we think is a candidate molecule, and we have quite a bit of data for that. Uh, we call it FGFPP1, fibroblast growth factor binding protein. It's an enhancer of FGF signaling. So what it does is it binds to FGF ligands that are secreted, and they tend to be tethered in the extracellular matrix. So this will be the motor axon, for, uh, the muscle fibers, and this is the motor axon, for example. And they're separated by a lot of extracellular matrix molecules, and growth factors tend to clump up right between the two um, sites of communication. And so what this factor does is it binds to the FGF ligands, it releases them from this anchoring sites and allows them, them to bind to receptors and increase FGF receptor signaling within the motor axon that then goes back to the cell body to promote survival but also maintenance of the synapse. Now this FGF BP1 has been shown to bind to three FGF ligands previously shown to function in the uh, maturation of neuromuscular junction. So that was another feature that attracted us to this uh, molecule. That's all great, but does it play a role in neuromuscular junction? Okay? And is it required uh, to slow degeneration of this synapse, particularly in, a, in the context of ALS? Well, let's go through some of the features that this molecule must possess uh, for us to really keep investing so much of our time. It must be expressed 
in muscle fibers or presynaptic Schwann cells. So we use a strategy, we use a transgenic animal that allows us to immunoprecipitate ribosomes from specific type of cells, in this case, muscle fibers. We immunoprecipitated ribosomes, and this work was spearheaded by these two, these two good looking fellows, Milagros and Thomas, postdoctoral fellows in my lab. Immunoprecipitated ribosomes specifically from muscle fibers and asked, is FGFBP1 there? Yes, the transcript is in the ribosomes of those uh, isolated from muscle fibers. It's increased, in fact, in muscle fiber, and here is a positive control for that, and the negative control for muscle fiber gene that is not supposed to be uh, enriched in muscle fibers. So, passes one of the tests. Second test is, is it at the, at the synapse? We use microdissection to isolate just the synaptic region of the muscle, this diaphragm muscle here, and looked at transcript levels of this molecule, and it is. It is enriched in the synaptic region uh, using uh, transcriptional analysis. When we stain for the molecule, for the protein itself, what we find is that it's in fact concentrated at the synapse. And this is the knockout as a control here, as a negative control that lacks uh, this factor. So it passes most of the muster that we're looking for. So what is it doing? Uh, is it important at all? Let me jump to ALS because this is about neurological diseases. We've gathered quite a bit of data on the function of this molecule in aging. But let's jump to ALS. So what about ALS? Is this uh, molecule altering ALS as it is following the injury of the nerve? Well, for that we use this mouse model for the disease. And as many other mouse models, this mouse model for the disease uh, is now, now has fallen out of favor. But I will caution people that tend to, you know, us as a scientific community, um, to not throw away models that actually recapitulate everything that happens pretty much in a human with the same type of mutation. So this mouse model expresses mutant SOD1, superoxide this mutase 1. The mouse with around 90 days begins to show symptoms and becomes symptomatic and the legs and hind limbs are paralyzed and then the disease moves rostrally. And then the mouse dies around 150 days of age. The timing is different in human, but that's pretty much how the disease progresses. And unfortunately, we don't have anything better than this mouse model for the disease at this point. The CR for anything else simply don't uh, pass any of the muster that one would look for. Uh, certainly cell culture as much as we want to, including iPSC cells, are still a long way to go. So the innovation of neuromuscular junctions really happening around this stage. Lots of it, but it begins, some begin right around 60 and 70 days of age. So we ask, is this molecule altering this mouse model for the disease? It is. It is significantly decreased in the pre-symptomatic stage, and it, is, it remains decreased even during the symptomatic, early symptomatic stages of the disease, 90 days of age. So right around here, and then it remains decreased. Um, so we reason, okay, so maybe this molecule is important for maintaining the synapse. If it is, this small amount of this growth factor may actually be delaying in a futile manner, mind you, delaying the disease, the innovation of the synapse. So if we get rid of all of it, we should accelerate the disease. And that's what we find. Right? We get rid of it, we delete this factor from that mouse model for the disease, and what we find is the neuromuscular junction, the motor axons retract earlier, uh, there's a lot more denervation, and only that. So that's the focus site of pathology, we believe, but what happens is that the mice die sooner. So uh, there's an acceleration of death in mice uh, that lack this growth factor compared to this mouse motor for the disease. Uh, when you look at both sexes, with neurological diseases, you always have to look at sexes separately, uh, separately, and what we find is that, in fact, yes, it is required in males and it is required in females, both of them uh, show an acceleration, an exacerbation of the disease progress uh, when we get, out, get rid of this molecule altogether. So why is it decrease? Why is there so little of it, uh, the neuromuscular junction and in muscles? Well, we've done quite a bit of digging and what we have found, um, I'll show you the data, but I'll tell you um, the conclusion of, uh, of our analysis so far is that the TGF-beta pathway seems to be the main culprit. So TGF-beta has been implicating aging of skeletal muscles, but it also has a lot of other functions. Um, one of the reasons that we focus on TGF-beta is that 
in no muscle fibers, in, in other cells, no muscle cells, um, it has been shown to block, to suppress FGFPP1 expression. TGF beta was also shown in muscles to target and inhibit, impair the function of this mechanism here, this MIR-206 H-DAC histone deacetylase mechanism. And this happens to be a mechanism that I, along with Eric Olson years ago, isolated, dissected out, and showed that it plays a very important role in regenerating neuromuscular junctions. So that was more than enough. There's a lot of features here that makes BP1 and TGF better promising candidates. So does it really inhibit FGF-BP1 in muscles? Uh, here's the levels of this factor, growth factor in muscle is decreased, as I showed you previously. TGF beta shows the opposite expression pattern is significantly increased, pre-symptomatic and very early symptomatic stages of the disease. When we use muscles in a dish to see if it if inhibits, suppresses BP1 expression, what we find is, is that it does. So if we treat muscles in a dish with TGF beta, there's less FGF BP1. When we block the receptor for TGF beta, BP1 levels come back up. So, and we have other data that now are indicating that yes, this may in fact be the case. So this is all looking at the general effect of TGF beta, general levels of TGF beta. We want to know exactly what's going on at the synaptic region. Is TGF beta potentially affecting the microRNA histone deacetylase uh, pathway, specifically at the synapse where we've shown where, where that mechanism and the FGFPP1 concentrate and play important roles? And so we looked at that by doing some immune histochemistry. Right? So we looked at TGF beta, and what we found to our surprise, in this case, pleasant surprise, um, is that this factor that inhibits BP1 is highly concentrated, the green here, at neuromuscular junction. So the red are, are the acetylcholine receptors on the other side on the muscle end. Right? So in an ALS mouse model, this is in the very early stages of symptoms, TGF beta concentrates there when a BP1 is decreased. Um, now, there are other places where TGF beta is also increased, other stages. That is in developing uh, animals, muscles, but also in aging mus uh, muscles. And so we wanted to know, well, is this concentration of TGF beta specific to ALS, or does it happen at any neuromuscular junction that is going a lot of rearrangement? During development, aging causes a lot of structural rearrangements, and we don't find exactly the same pattern. TGF beta is diffusely distributed throughout the muscle, unlike the ALS condition. So this, I think, gives us some hope that um, we have found one factor that is significantly reduced. It's a secretive factor, so um, a little bit easier to work with. We know that it's in the bloodstream, so it may be a candidate for, uh, 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 as a biomarker. And the other one, TGF beta, is also secreted. But I think for TGF beta, and I'm shortcutting uh, the summary here because I'm running out of time. For TGF beta, I think what's really important here and really novel, perhaps, for, especially for, for the um, purpose of this meeting is that it is concentrated as sign up. So one can then start to daydream about uh, mimetics, other approaches, and one can modify TGF beta to label the synaptic region of skeletal muscles and do some imaging to see if uh, an individual or an animal model that one uses to um, test therapeutics is about to undergo lots of innovation. And so this type of approach actually will basically tell us that a synapse is about to get on fire, right, before it degenerates, which is really what we want. We want to stop the disease before it happens. And so with that, I'd like to thank again everyone in my lab, but now I included myself here because they never do. And thank, thank you all.